God empowers us by the Holy Spirit to do what he has called us to do. He doesn't empower us to do what we ourselves strive to do in order to please man. And so if we're doing something in our own power and it's not working out very well, it's worth asking ourselves. Hello and welcome back to my channel. As you can see, the title for today's video is You Must Obey God Rather Than Men. This is taken from a really popular verse in Acts chapter five. So for today's video, we're gonna be taking a look at that story and talking about why we must obey God rather than men. And we're also gonna be asking ourselves the question, are we living to please man or are we living to please God? Because obedience to God yields the blessing. And so we're gonna be talking all about that. I'm also gonna be sharing with you something crazy that happened as I was prepping the outline for this video video that God really just used to drive home the point of this video. And so we're going to be getting into all of that in just a second. If you haven't already, please be sure to hit the subscribe button. I make Christian faith and lifestyle content aimed at encouraging you to know God more through his word and to grow in his likeness. And I would love to have you here and then give this video a thumbs up if you find it helpful or encouraging. So let's go ahead and get into the verse now that I pulled the title from this video from. So it's Acts 5. Five, verse 29 and it says but Peter and the Apostles answered we must obey God rather than men so let's do a little bit of context to this verse first of all one chapter back in chapter 4 Peter and John were first told by the religious leaders to stop preaching the name of Jesus so I'm gonna read through the whole passage here's what it says Acts 4 13 through 17 now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men they were astonished and they recognized that they had been with Jesus but seeing the man who was healed standing beside them they had nothing to say in opposition but when they had commanded them to leave the council they conferred with one another saying what shall we do with these men for that a notable sign has been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem and we cannot deny it but in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. First of all, I think it's just so funny that they can't even say that, you know, they don't want the apostles to speak in the name of Jesus. They say, we must warn them to no longer speak in this name. They don't want to speak the name of Jesus. A couple other things I want to point out from this passage. It says they perceived that Peter and John, that the apostles, they were uneducated common men, but they they had been with Jesus. And so essentially they're saying there's nothing special about these men, but the work of the Holy Spirit was so bold, so powerful, so supernatural in them that people couldn't question, they couldn't deny that they had been with Jesus. I think this can sort of have two meanings here because on the one hand, they're saying that they recognized that these men had been with Jesus, that they were his disciples, they were associated with him, but it also meant that they recognized that Jesus was still working in and through them because again of what he was doing through them was so undeniable a couple other points of context the religious people we're talking about here is the Sanhedrin which was a Jewish court of law now why did the Sanhedrin not want the name of Jesus to be spread as we keep reading through the passage we're gonna see that part of that is because of jealousy they saw that the fame of the Apostles was growing their religious power was great because again it was the power of the Holy Spirit working in them but also it was the Sanhedrin that Jesus had gone to trial before his crucifixion and so quite possibly another element at play here is that they didn't want people to realize that they had been at least partially responsible for killing the man who had claimed to be God and clearly was and is so the Sanhedrin see the works being done in the name of Jesus they see his name being spread and because of this they tell Peter and John not to speak the name name of Jesus. But Peter and John ask, should we listen to you or should we listen to God? Like you tell us, what do you think sounds like the smarter decision? And so here's what it says in Acts 4 verses 18 through 20. So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge for we cannot but speak of what we have seen and 
heard. They're saying we can't help but share what we have literally witnessed. We have borne witness to it and we are now sharing that with other people. So that's what happens in Acts chapter four to set up what we're now gonna see in Acts chapter five. So now let's fast forward to the second half of Acts five. The apostles continue to do signs and wonders in the name of Jesus. And in verses 17 and 18, it says that the high priest and Sadducees were filled with jealousy. So they threw the apostles in public prison. Now, the Sadducees were sort of like a wealthy, social, and religious Jewish elite. And they, along with the high priests, throw the apostles in prison. But here's what happens in Acts 5, verses 19 and 20. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, go and stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. The angel literally facilitates a prison break for the apostles and he commands them to continue preaching the name of Jesus. It says, share or speak to the people all the words of this life. Share the gospel in the gospel in Jesus is life, both life to the fullest here on earth and eternal life. Now let's keep reading in Acts 5 verses 21 through 29 to see what happens after the prison break. It says, now when the high priest came and those who were with him, they called together the council, all the Senate of the people of Israel and sent to the prison to have them brought. But when the officers came, they did not find them in the prison. So they returned and reported, we found the prison securely locked and the guards standing at the doors. But when we opened them, we found no one inside. Now, when the captain of the temple and the chief priests heard these words, they were greatly perplexed about them, wondering what this would come to. And someone came and told them, look, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Then the captain with the officers went and brought them, but not by force, for they were afraid of being stoned by the people. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council. And the high priest questioned them saying, we strictly charged you not to teach in this name. Yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than men. I wanna point out a couple things from the text here so we can sort of examine our own hearts and determine, are we living to please God or are we living to please people? So zooming in again on that verse, Acts 5, 26, it says, then the captain with the officers went and brought them, but not by force for they were afraid of being stoned by the people. So let's paint a little picture here. The apostles are thrown into prison. The angel breaks them out of prison and tells them to go continue teaching the name of Jesus. So they're not in the temple preaching the name of Jesus. The people see the power of God through the works that they are performing. And this clearly instills a fear in the officers and the captain of the Sanhedrin, the Sadducees, all these religious people. So they go to take in the apostles, but they don't want to use force because they realize the crowds love the apostles and they don't want to make the crowds hate them. And I just think it is so interesting that the Sanhedrin feared the people, but they didn't fear God who was clearly at work among the disciples. They were more concerned about man's opinion than God's. And I think we can see here that fearing people leads to a sense of needing to control, needing to coerce people, of doubling down and protecting yourself or covering yourself even when you realize you were in the wrong. And so I think that's something we can sort of self-reflect on. Do we feel in certain situations the need to control people's perceptions of us, to coerce or manipulate things to go in our favor or go in a particular way? Or do we feel the need to double down and protect ourselves because we don't want to look like we had got it wrong and now we look dumb? Those are sort of some results or some fruit of what happens when we fear people. So the Sanhedrin tries to control and ultimately quiet the apostles apostles, but the apostles, they were not intimidated by the council's authority because they saw how God had protected them and how God had worked boldly through them. They feared God more than they feared man. And we can see from this that fearing God leads to boldness and freedom. Which of these is more true about you? I'm asking myself the same thing. Which of these is more true about me? Is it more true of me that I feel the need to control or coerce or manipulate things to make 
make sure I'm perceived a certain way or to cover myself? Or am I living more in freedom and boldness? Which of these is more true of you? Are you trying to obey God or people? Are you living to please the crowd or to please God? I feel like it's pretty easy for me to filter things that I say or do through the lens of what will people think? How will this make people perceive me? What will people think of me if I do this? But what if instead we were to filter everything that we do through the lens of what will God think of this? What if our every thought, desire, action was driven by what will God think of this? What will please him the most? What will be the most obedient to his word? Now, of course, as Christians, we are called to submit to the authorities that God has placed in our lives. Romans 13, 1 says, let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. And so we are called to respect those authorities. We're also instructed to pray for people in power. First Timothy 2, 1 through 2 says, First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may live a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. But as we see from this passage in Acts chapter 5, when human law contradicts Predicts God's clear commands, it is always God who we must obey. One last thing I want to point out from this story is that obedience to God is what yields the blessing. As Peter continues on in his response saying we must obey God rather than man, he then goes into a gospel presentation, Acts 5 verses 30 through 32 saying, the God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things. And so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. I want you to notice that last part of the verse where it says, God has given the Holy Spirit to those who obey him. A note from a commentary on this verse says, thus the disciples declare that the obedience to God was also the reason why the Holy Spirit had been bestowed upon them, leaving it to be gathered that what God has done, he will do again and bestow his gifts of grace on those who are willing to obey him. God empowers us by the Holy Spirit to do what he has called us to do. He doesn't empower us to do what we ourselves strive to do in order to please man. And so if we're doing something in our own power and it's not working out very well, it's worth asking ourselves, are we actually obeying what God has asked us to do? Or are we doing what we think we need to do in order to impress or please man? We must obey God rather than man. We must live to please God rather than man. Funny story about something that happened as I was prepping this very outline. So typically I film on Friday mornings, but this past week we had friends staying with us, which was so much fun, but I didn't get to film. And so I had planned to film today, which is a Sunday morning before church as Judah man is napping in the other room, but I hadn't had a chance yet to finish prepping my outline to film. And so I was like, let me just work on it yesterday, which was Saturday, which is typically the day that we practice Sabbath and I don't do any work. And I had sort of justified it in my mind thinking, you know, yes, I don't typically work on this day, but I really didn't work at all through the week because we had friends staying with us. And so I'm just going to finish it on Saturday so I can film on Sunday. Well, as I'm prepping this outline, I had gotten a little bit done and then I literally fell asleep with my laptop on my lap and didn't finish it. And as I woke up, Judah was also waking up from his nap. So it was sort of like that missed opportunity, but I feel like God was kind of showing me that the very thing that I'm talking about in this video applied to that situation. Now, I don't think it necessarily would have been sinful to continue working on the outline that day, but I think that God showed me, me working on the outline that day on a Saturday was sort of driven by this desire to want to make sure I didn't miss a video, to want to make sure that I was staying consistent. And again, that's not a bad thing. It's good to be consistent, especially in work. 
but that was overriding the desire to obey and honor God and this rhythm that we've developed in our lives to implement the Sabbath. And it's just a silly sort of little simple example, but I think it so powerfully speaks to this reality that sometimes we do things our own way, either because we think it needs to be done or because we need to please people or we need to keep up or whatever it may be. And we're wondering why we're spinning our wheels or it's not working. And it's because God empowers us to do what he has called us to do and he empowers us to do it his way. And so when we try to do it our own way or we're neglecting to obey him fully in the things that he is asking us to do, well then we're not receiving the empowerment by his Holy Spirit that we would receive if we were walking in obedience. And so that's my little moral of the story, how this spoke to me this week as I was prepping this outline. As God gave me that realization, I decided, you know what? I'm not gonna work on this at all anymore on Saturday today. I'm just going to get up early on Sunday and try to finish prepping the outline before Judah wakes up. And then I'm gonna film right now, which is during his nap, which is what I had planned. And I feel like God just brought everything together as I was prepping it. And I feel like it really just speaks to this truth that obedience yields the blessing. And so I would love to hear from you down in the comments. What is God asking you to be obedient to him in? I'm going to be sharing an answer to that in a pinned comment as well. I hope that you found this video encouraging. Thank you so much for being here and I will see you in my next one. Bye.